while Clint Brook, Clint Brooks, um, does not really outline the stages of his uh, of his methodology, um, uh, while he doesn't sort of give us a step by step of the kind of how to complete the kind of reading um, he seems to be promoting in the Well Wrought Urn, though he certainly um, uh, does this elsewhere, uh, I'm sure. Uh, our textbook, Parker, uh, Parker, How to Interpret Literature, does a pretty good job of extracting and distilling um, out of the well wrought urn a few somewhat vague steps <laughs> for how to complete uh, a, a new critical reading. Okay, so if you turn to page 20 in this book, um, <clears throat> After pointing out, after pointing out in, in Parker's book, and I think uh, maybe I didn't make this as clear as I should have in, in the lecture that I, um, in the lecture that I gave, sorry, I'm going to close my email so that it doesn't ding again. Um, in the, in the previous installment of this lecture series, I, I may not have really drawn out that there, there's an odd tension even within new criticism, within the new critical model itself between an idea that literary criticism should um, should articulate the kind of uh, tensions and contradictions and discrepancies and paradoxes and ambiguities of a poem, and yet also value the idea of unity and harmony and balance, right? So it's really this tension between the idea of unity and the idea of contradiction that Parker begins with when he begin when he outlines what the steps of a new critical approach to literature might look like. Okay, so he writes. This is page twenty. By this point in the description of new criticism, some readers might smell a rat. How can the new critics believe that the same poem, novel, story, or play they describe as fraught with paradox, ambiguity, tension, and irony is also unified? That paradox in new criticism dramatizes a key issue for the new critics, an apparent contradiction that, th contradiction that threatened to topple their entire system, because paradox, ambiguity, tension, and irony might seem to make the literary text a seething stew of conflicts, which sounds like the opposite of unity, right? disunity. But the new critics managed to make that apparent contradiction integral to the system that it threatened to topple. <clears throat> Excuse me. They proposed that eventually, at least in great literature, that's important, the paradoxes, ambiguities, tensions, and ironies all balanced each other, all balanced each other out, suspending the competing energies in a unified harmony. That way of reading takes what might seem like a fatal contradiction between unity, on the one hand, and paradox, ambiguity, tension, and irony, on the other and turns the apparent contradiction into a unity-making machine, into the very definition of great literature. It also turns the work of finding that balance into the purpose and goal of literary criticism. Even readers learning here about new criticism for the first time have probably seen and heard criticism work according to that new critical model many times. In the classroom, in criticism they may have read, and perhaps even in papers they have written. The usual pattern is pretty standard now, but the new critic invented it, or new critics invented it. First, the critic, whether a professional critic or a student writing a paper, finds a problem. For the new critics, the problem, as we have seen, often took the form of a paradox, ambiguity, tension, irony, or a combination of these overlapping categories. Then the critic traces the pattern of that problem as it repeats itself across the text. Skipping the next few lines, because it's referring to a poem that we, we're not going to look at, turn to the top of 21. Then, so first step, find a problem. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Step two, trace that problem across the text, show how it recurs uh, in a kind of problematic pattern across the text. Then, at the last possible moment, it's kind of funny how Parker writes this, just when the text seems ready to crash into unresolvable chaos and the new critical method seems ready to collapse, the new critics 
the new critic rescues the critical method and the text itself by brilliantly pointing out how the balanced suspension of competing possibilities makes a larger argument about the relation between, <clears throat> in this case, two different kinds of love, referring to the poem that he's referencing here, or the mysteries and multiple possibilities of literary language, and perhaps even about poetry itself. In this way, the New Critics offered a systematic critical method, interpretations of individual texts, and also a claim that literary language itself depended on a balanced tension of ambiguity, irony, and paradox. So that's a long, a long passage, so I apologize. It took a long time to get through it, but I think it's important. For one, it's odd that Parker calls this mode of reading systematic, because ultimately it relies upon the reader's ability to notice a problem in the first place. It relies upon the ingenuity, cleverness, and ability of the reader to recognize symbols, words that are out of place, um, uh, 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 figures that just seem odd, <laughs> right, in the context in which they're being used. Um, noticing a discrepancy, uh, a discontinuity, a contradiction, right? Um, and it also assumes that readers um, can follow that pattern through the complex text. Far from being systematic, I think, the method of reading Brooks performs and theorizes in the well-wrought urn seems a bit vague, open-ended. This is probably the reason he co-authored textbooks that were much more detailed in their treatment of how to pay attention to very aspects of poet, to the very aspects or what we often call the elements of fiction, poetry, and drama. Since we don't have time to work our way through those textbooks, if we had a 35-week semester, maybe we would do that. For now, let's just formulate the methodology of new criticism, according to Brooks and Parker, at least, in the following way. Right. So, step one. Find a text and isolate it from any, from any and all concerns with authorial intentions or cultural context or, your, or one's own personal biases, right? So isolate it, try to pay attention only to what's going on in the text. Okay. Step two, after reading and rereading it, notice a problem, right? Now this is important because by problem, I don't mean find a part of the text you don't like. That's, that's not what I mean. What I mean is notice <clears throat> a moment of odd deviation, when maybe the connotation of a particular word that used that is used seems out of sync with the rest of what the poem is doing, or notice a part of the poem that structurally, even visually, looks different from the rest of the poem. Um, notice some sort of shift in rhyme scheme or metrical pattern, or even, even at the level of theme Right, is there, is there some sort of paradox going on? Um, uh, what, what sort of poetic idea seems to be expressed, not in a single line, but across the whole poem, right? That's the kind of, uh, those are the sorts of problems that Brooks, anyway, uh, was interested in identifying and pursuing, right? So step two, after isolating the text, notice a problem with the text in the text. Part three, track variations of that problem throughout the text. Demonstrate that the text seems at odds with itself. Step four, show how that problem, which threatens both the coherence of the poem and of the new critical method itself, is actually the key to understanding the unity and harmony of the text's many parts. The problem that one may notice in a text may have to do with a paradoxical situation or description, with the ambiguity of the writer's use of words, with the tension between various frames of the poem, meaning between its sound and sense, maybe. Sound and sense, maybe. Or with a troubling or confusing symbol or metaphor. Right? A metaphor that isn't clear, but seems to actually trip us up as, as we're trying to make sense of what the poem is saying. That would be a good spot to, to pause and wonder and 
and, and begin a reading. In short, the problem should be something that sticks out to you, that may even initially bother you about the text, but not something that bothers you, again, not something that bothers you personally. The problem has to be intrinsic to the poem itself, right? So you're not looking for a moment that like offends you or something, or, or, or a moment that you think is like um, maybe immoral or something, um, but something that confuses you, bothers you, doesn't make sense, seems out of sync with the rest of what's going on around it. In this regard, to practice close reading, as Brooks performs and theorizes it, means <clears throat> to retrain your attitude toward difficulty and complexity so that you open your mind and open yourself to moments in novels, poems, and plays that do not immediately make sense to you. Why? Because that's where reading truly begins for Brooks and for new critics. That's where criticism as a skill, excuse me, as a process, as a mode of engaging with the potential life of a text, of a poem, of a of fiction, of a play, can begin. Thus, new criticism, at least as Brooks might imagine it, requires patience, time, skill, and familiarity with literature in order to be done well. But even if all of us, or a few of us, are lacking these qualities, there's no better time to practice than here and now. Um, <clears throat> and so in class, I brought a few examples. Uh, I brought two, two poems in. Um, one is by uh, a World War I poet named Wilfred Owen, uh, a poem entitled Dulce et Decorum Est. That's Latin, so don't be scared that you don't know what that means. Um, and a poem by Sylvia Plath uh, called Morning Song. I'm, I don't think I'll have time to talk about the Plath poem, um, <clears throat> but I do encourage all of you to go look it up and, and, and read it on your own. This will also be included in the handout that I'm, I'll be posting on Sakai, so it might be a good idea um, to print that off and follow along in the poem as I read through it and work through um, a, a kind of provisional new critical reading of what's going on in it, okay? So, um, so I, I think I should just read it, right? Wilfred Owen, uh, Dulce et Decorum Est. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many limped on, blood shod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that fell behind. Excuse me, dropped behind, sorry. Gas, gas, quick boys. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the wide eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie. Dulce et decorum est. Propatria mori. Okay, so that's the poem. <clears throat> 
Um, really quickly, just a bit of, of, of definitions. The last two lines of the poem, um, the, 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 the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, uh, our dulce et decorum est pro patria mori is Latin. Uh, it's a line taken from uh, a Roman, ancient Roman poet named Horace in his odes. Um, and it means, uh, quote, it is sweet and meat, meaning sweet and decorous, um, to die for one's country. <clears throat> okay. So it's important that, you know, this, this sounds like a sort of slogan, you know, sort of um, inspiring, inspiring men to go to war, right? Um, but here it's important to keep in mind in that penultimate line, the second to last line, that our poet describes it as a lie, meaning it is not sweet and decorous. It is not sweet and meat to die for one's country. Um, and moreover, right, um, my friend, if you could have paced behind the wagon that we had th we threw our dead comrade in. Um, uh, you would not tell with such delight, with such encouragement, high zest um, to children <clears throat> ardent, desirous for some desperate glory. You know, children who are brought up, particularly boys, wanting to be heroes, wanting to be war heroes, wanting to be um, explorers, adventurers. You would not tell them this lie because it is not sweet, it is not meat, it is not decorous, it is not dolce et decorum, okay? So that's just explaining those last few lines, just so you get a sense of what's going on there. <clears throat> back, to the, back to the lecture. If we were traditional literary historians, we might attend to Owen's diction and ask why, uh, ask which poets of the great tradition of war poetry, because it's after all a, a war poem, um, which which poets uh, he seems to have read, uh, perhaps Tennyson, perhaps Shakespeare, um, perhaps Pope's Alexander Pope's translation of Homer's epics. Um, if we were the kinds of critics that new critics resisted, we might also locate the meaning of the poem in the historical fact of World War One and in Owen's biographical relation to it. It is a poem, after all, excuse me, written by a soldier who would later be killed in the war. Um, it, is after, it is a poem, after all, about the gruesomeness of battle and the horrors of, of losing um, one's fellows. A new critic might ask, though, but does the description, but does this description that it's a, it's about war, about the gruesomeness of war, really capture the complex of competing attitudes, figures, and other features in the poem? Is this a poem simply about World War I? If we were impressionists, we may cling to the universality, universality of warfare and its horrors or the harsh reality of the death of the young as the meaning of the poem. We might ask ourselves, when have I ever felt this way, this despair? Is this not the best depiction of warfare ever? How does the poem make me feel? A new critic would respond, but even if we answered this question, there would be no attention to how the poem generates that feeling. How does the structure of the poem, <clears throat> how does its form, attempt to capture and reorder the actual complexity of the experience of which it seems to be speaking. Forget for a second how it initially makes me feel. Think of it as, as an object. Isolate it. How does it work? If I reread the poem on the lookout for tensions, contradictions, ambiguities, and paradoxes, what do I see? Is it purely a descriptive, mimetic text? Is it propositional? Does it have a simple moral or a simple message? Upon rereading the poem, I stumble over the phrase in the second stanza, an ecstasy of fumbling. And I think to myself, how odd. And there's the beginning. A new critic would add, why is this odd? What is the poetic activity that catches my eye here? 
The phrase, an ecstasy of fumbling, is not just window dressing. It's not just a frill. It's not just something that poets do to make something gruesome sound beautiful. It's something we should pay attention to and wonder about. For after all, the poem does not simply say, we were startled and clumsily put on our gas masks uh, when we realized we were under attack, right? Which is sort of what's said in the second stanza. No, this act of fumbling for gas masks is compared to and figured as an ecstasy. Is ecstasy really a word I would normally use to evoke the activity of battle? What does ecstasy mean? Here we need to look it up. We shouldn't rely on our own vocabulary skills. And let's ignore for a second that this is an effort to get help from something outside of the text itself. Ecstasy really suggests two or three things. One, the sort of colloquial way in which we use it, is an overwhelming feeling of great happiness. In this way, it's a synonym for rapture or bliss, right? Um, that's the first sort of sense. The second is it, it is a sort of mystical trans-like state, uh, trance-like state, and, and, and in this sense is sort of in relation um, uh, to drugs and to drug culture, right? The, the drug ecstasy, after all. Sort of sense of a heightenedness, right? Being outside of yourself. But according to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, it is the state of being beside oneself, thrown into a frenzy or a stupor with anxiety, astonishment, fear, or passion. Hmm. You can see that these definitions, which compete with each other, that don't sort of resolve into one nice definition, makes things a bit difficult. If we were the kind of scientists that Brooks imagines, we would need to figure out which of these definitions correspond to Owen's meaning. Ideally, we would also want to refine the definition so that it only meant one thing. But as the quotes on the handout suggest from Brooks, this is not the job of the literary critic, who must insert himself or herself into the nexus of contradictory meanings. Here, the conflict between great happiness, a trance-like state, and being forced beside oneself with some sort of overwhelming complex of emotions. Even if we were to choose one of them, we would still be left with our initial question. Isn't it odd to describe the activity of battle as an ecstasy, particularly an awkward activity of battle, fumbling for gas masks as a kind of ecstasy? Well, to answer that question, we should probably reread the poem. Remember that for Brooks, a poem is akin to a drama, insofar as its meaning is unfolded and developed from the first line to the last line. Though, remember, this doesn't mean that the last lines are the clearest statements of what the poem really means. Given his sense of how poems make meaning, we should ask, how might the first stanza help us begin seeing the formal unity or lack thereof that harmonizes the contradictory sense of warfare and the multiple denotations and connotations of ecstasy. Here too we run into something we may not have noticed before, that the soldiers in the first stanza are making their way toward their distant rest, even while many of them are asleep. What does that mean, right? Going toward one's distant rest though one is already asleep? The following lines give a sense of dulled automation. These soldiers have lost control of their mo motor skills. Some of them have lost limbs. They've lost their sight. They cannot hear even the large shells that are falling behind them, the five nines, right, are described as tired. Indeed, the soldiers are drunk, drunk with fatigue, asleep, lame, blind, deaf, tired. <clears throat> One sees a pattern forming here in the first stanza. There is something trance-like here. This is a picture, in a way, of soldiers being beside themselves, unable to feel, think, or rest, even when they are asleep. Though it may be odd to think of it this way, there's already a state of ecstasy here. <laughs>
in the first stanza. So what can we say about this? That the phrase, an ecstasy of fumbling, is even more complicated than we might think. Within the context of this first stanza, the affectless, automatic, dulled, tired of marching, right? Within this context, the appearance of ecstasy has both a literal and ironic sense to it. On the one hand, the soldiers are thrown out of this state of automatic marching into a frenzied, that is an imprecise, irrational, helplessly awkward and inefficient fumbling. This would be the literal sense. In the, sorry, in the second stanza, I think I messed that up a bit. And yet ecstasy at the beginning of this second stanza still carries with it that mystical, blissful sense of heightenedness that is at odds with the context of the poem, with the dreariness and gruesomeness of war. Though ironic, though the word actually is communicating the gruesomeness by being so out of place, ecstasy can actually, as the OED shows us, encompass a state of terror and fear as well. It is then a perfect word for this moment, the rupture of dulled marching into frenzied activity, the expression of the horror of war, and even the way in which the speaker's experience of war seems to be nothing but a series of oscillations between trance and frenzy, between automation and heightened, heightened, excited, irrational um, fumbling. both of which, trance and frenzy, fall under the potential meanings of ecstasy. The automated march in the first stanza is a kind of ecstasy. The fumbling with the helmets, frantic, panicked, unthinking, is also an ecstasy. Yet it remains awkward, just like the soldiers, ecstasy as a description of war. How does this experience of war as a perpetual series of trances and frenzies of ecstasies in a word play out later in the poem? The third, third stanza seems to carry on this pattern since it focuses on dreams, the speaker being beside himself, unable to control himself under the influence of something happening to him. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me guttering, choking, drowning. Here too, we get a sense of a sleep that offers no rest, a dream that offers no, no, no compensation for the horrors of actual life. A sense of sleep, of ecstasy, of an oscillation between frenzy and trance that offers no, no, rest, a state that follows the soldier, that continues to follow one of the soldiers, even after this event, a soldier whose march toward a distant rest continues long after this battle, even in the very writing of the poem itself. But in order to fulfill the task of the new critic, we also have to try and make sense of the last stanza, the longest in the poem, in relation to this ecstatic pattern. In describing the dead body that the soldiers must throw in their wagon, there is a sense in which there is a sort of in which the state of that dead soldier is itself the most possible highest, the excuse me, not the most possible, but the highest sense of the kind of odd ecstasy at work in the poem itself. For it is, in a sense, a, a position of sleep that, again, offers no rest and means that there will never be a possibility of rest ever again. Now, I don't have time to develop that here. This All of this is just to show that um, how I would begin with a problem and then try to track that through the poem, um, beginning to see a kind of unity and harmony working itself out, even in the even um, even despite or actually because of the contradictions inherent in the word ecstasy itself. 
Um, uh, so if I were to complete that reading, I would have to continue working with that last stanza and maybe even hook it up to some of the descriptions, right? The similes that the poet uses to describe this dead body. What does it mean, right? That the dead soldier's face is a hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin, right? Or why does the sound, right, of, of, of what's coming out of his mouth why does it sound obscene as cancer? Why bitter as the cut of vile and curable sores on innocent tongues? And maybe there's also a relationship between this ecstasy of fumbling and the children who are ardent for some desperate glory. I'm not sure, right? But it's a possibility, and if I were writing and completing a reading of the poem, I would try to incorporate those things also into this unity-making machine that this one word, ecstasy, turns out to be. Okay. Now, remember what I said in my first video, that, um, that the method of new criticism, isolating the poem, finding a problem, tracking the problem, showing how that problem is actually uh, uh, the key to finding the unity and harmony of the poem itself, right? If it's a great poem, right? Or if it's a, you know, if we're dealing with poetry, of course. Um, that though that seems systematic, it in, no, it in no way really is systematic in the sense that an, another reader of this poem might not even notice the phrase ecstasy of fumbling is a problem. They might notice a different problem, right? And in that sense, since they have a different starting point, might end up producing a reading of the poem that looks nothing like mine, right? So anyway, I'll, I'll leave this there, and I hope this helps sort of make some sort of sense about uh, what a new critical approach to a poem might look like. In class on Tuesday, we're going to try to approach Mrs. Dalloway uh, in the same way, right? Paying very close attention to what's in the novel itself um, and what sort of problems arise for us in our reading, right? Problems that are in the text itself, problems of its structure and form, right? Um, um, and, and we'll see what we can make of it in our discussions on Tuesday. Okay, well, I wish you a happy weekend and I will see you then. All right.